Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Brand Architects Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Quinton Hyam, CEO, Thomas Carter, CFO, and Joe Hutton, Commercial Director of Brand Architects PLC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our first uh, retailer investor presentation. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself. So I joined as CEO on the 4th of May, height of lockdown, uh, but my background has been uh, pretty much beauty most of my career. So I started off at Revlon, where I was there from 92 to 99, and a variety of sales and marketing positions. So I was head of marketing by the end. I then joined Swatch. So I was there for three years as brand director. And after that, I went to Coty, uh, where I was a marketing director, but also had commercial responsibility for Greece and Turkey. Uh, and then I had my, uh, I went to a small business called KMI, where we had brands such as Fish and Ted Baker. I ran my own business uh, for four years after that uh, as a sort of uh, sales and marketing consultant. And then for the previous uh, last 10 years, I was managed director of Yardley, which is part of Wipro Consumer Care. So to my right, you have Tom, who will introduce himself, and then Joe uh, will also follow. Hi, so I'm Tom. I joined as CFO uh, in June. I trained as a chartered accountant with PwC, and then after that, did a number of roles uh, within industry. Uh, very relevant to Brand Architects Group would be my time at Procter and Gamble, uh, and also as business controller at Alliance Boots. Um, latterly, I was the Group Finance and Operations Director at Technetics, which is a market-leading hardware technology company. Hello, I'm Joe. I also joined the June of this year. Um, so still in full lockdown. Um, I am very pleased and very excited to join the business. I've spent the last 11 years in beauty, um, but before that I spent um, just shy on six years within retail, so uh, within high street retail. So um, the last 10 years in beauty have been predominantly at Superdrug, where I headed up the skincare team there. Um, and latterly, I have uh, moved over to the supplier side, so working with brand builders likes of Mesa, um, which is a French um, business, um, and then most recently at a small colour cosmetics brand called MUA, um, which is big in um, mass cosmetics within Superdrug. Thanks, Joe. So we just thought um, we'd give a little bit of background, um, depending on, on your knowledge of the business. So uh, Brand Architects Group PLC was called Swallowfield, um, which predominantly was a contract manufacturing business. And that particular model is high volume, low margin, it's labor intensive, asset rich, um, and very dependent on uh, customer purchase patterns. But uh, five years ago, the executive at the time uh, wanted to uh, improve margins, and so they went on an acquisition trail, and they bought the Real Shave Company in 2015, and then they bought Brand Architects in June 2016, Fish in 2018. And then last year, the, the board were approached by a company called KDC1, who uh, made an offer to buy the contra manufacturing business. And that took place in August 2019 for £35 million. As a result of the disposal of the, of the contra manufacturing, the brand architects PLC meant that we were a, um, a solely focused beauty business with higher margins, control of our own destiny. Uh, there's a very wide and good uh, portfolio of brands. We could focus on MPD and continue to build our existing relationships. Uh, one of the important things of the, of the disposal of the contra manufacturing is it left us with a uh, 18 million net cash on the balance sheet. During that time, the uh, executive were focused on transitioning from Swallowfield uh, to Brand Architects. So as a consequence, the new operation was set up in Teddington's, where um, the three of us are today. Um, and that meant setting up new financial uh, practices, processes. Um, there was the Chris Howe, who was the previous CEO. He came in as the interim uh, CEO from October 19 until my arrival in May. 
um, towards the end of the last fiscal, so that uh, ended at the end of uh, June 2020, it was obviously the impact of COVID. So that did have um, serious repercussions on the high street between March and June. But during that time, the board appointed the new executive who were you're meeting today for the first time. Um, so we've all joined, I think it's coming up to like six months. So in terms of the financials, I think it's fair to say this presentation is focusing very much on our strategic intent uh, for the business, but here are some very high level uh, numbers to confirm what happened last year uh, for the year 1920, uh, ending in June. So the business from a net sales perspective delivered 16.3 million in revenue with a gross profit margin of 35.2%, that margin percentage being very much consistent with the prior year. From a profit before tax perspective, the group delivered 2.2 million. I think it's worth saying that that is for the combined group and includes the uh, profit on the sale of the contract manufacturing business. But the revenue of 16.3 million is fully focused on the brand's business that we take going forward. And as Quentin said in the last slide, uh, the group boasts a very strong balance sheet. And at the year end, the net cash balance was 18 million. So where we are now is that we are positioning ourselves as a British beauty challenger branded business. We are focused on insight led brand development. That's a combination of gut instinct that the business has relied on successfully in the past but also by bringing in more consumer-centric uh, consumer data analysis. And that will help fund, fuel our MPD plans. Um, we continue to use third-party manufacturing. So when we moved from Swallowfield to our new suppliers, it was important that we focused on ethical and efficient sourcing models. Um, as we'll come on to it later, but one of the key challenges uh, that we're excited about is taking our brands from being uh, exclusive to certain retailers and making them omnichannel brands, whereby we'll create noise, buzz, invigorate those brands so that we drive consumers to store to pick the brands up rather than relying on finding them in store. So the initial observations when I came is that um, we had to look at a number of touch points within the business. So uh, since May, we have undertaken a organizational uh, restructure so essentially bringing sales and marketing together um, whilst looking at some improvements in the finance and operations structure. Um, underpinning all that is that we've uh, recognized that we need to invest more in our systems and efficiencies. And Tom's going to explain a little bit more about that in due course. We've had a full review of the portfolio of brands. Uh, we've also undertaken uh, or implemented new HR policies for the business. Uh, and that addresses uh, the new hybrid uh, way of working, which is obviously combinations of working from home and working in the office. Uh, and we've uh, launched a sustainability blueprint because it's uh, as important for us as it is the consumer that we are, where possible, using sustainable ingredients, that we are using post-consumer recycled material, uh, but also that we want to be giving something back to society. So in terms of our strategic priorities and growth plan, uh, so what we're looking to do is unveil a very ambitious plan uh, going from a 16.3 million net sales business to a 50 million net sales business, hence the Project 50 title in five years' time. And we see four key strategic pillars as driving this uh, growth plan to 50 million in net sales. The first one, as Quentin mentioned, is operational efficiency, uh, so the first column. So we're looking to very much uh, invest in our control systems, both are widening our own ERP systems, but also uh, buying consumer-centric data. So we'll invest in business intelligence software that will help us anticipate future requirements and uh, uh, identify trends and opportunities. At the same time, we'll purchase external consumer data, namely IRI and EPOS, an example would be Nectar dashboards, so that we can be close to our consumers who are our ultimate end customers. And also from a uh, balance sheet and product availability point of view, uh, invest in demand planning tools so that we have excellent forecast accuracy and we manage our inventory levels appropriately for that availability. The second strategic pillar is optimizing our product portfolio. So we're very much focused on fewer, bigger and better. 
we're looking to rationalize both our brand and our product lineup. Um, two key priorities within that. So over the next two years, we'll be addressing our product portfolio with the ultimate aim of reducing our SKUs by approximately 25%. The other one is that we will use uh, M&A uh, where we can, deals to, that will complement both our brands and our product portfolio. The third strategic pillar is uh, through our channels. So uh, we have a very good history as a business of retailer exclusives. So we'll continue to pursue that and win within that arena. But also we want to focus on taking our brands on the channel uh, so that we can win both in the high street with grocers, with e-tailers, and also uh, direct to consumer e-commerce websites. And with that effect, we will invest in significantly within our D2C activity across all our main brands. And within our Project 50 strategy, we have um, a very aggressive strategy within that to uh, aim to achieve 20% of our product, Project 50 revenues uh, through the D2C channel. The fourth strategic pillar is the environmental and social responsibility. Uh, we recognize that acting responsibly uh, is not only the right thing to do, but also it's something that our customers and ultimately consumers uh, very much expect from our business. So within that, we launched our sustainability blueprint in September uh, that will have impacts across our business and our supplier partners. Uh, and with this roadmap, we very much have the objective to be a carbon neutral business. Uh, and where possible, we will also look to identify uh, supporting the community and uh, supporting charitable activities that complement our brands and their mission. So as I mentioned earlier, we did a full review of our portfolio and we've looked at that from uh, five ways. Firstly, it was basically to uh, define each brand by its positioning. So we've used the good, better, best category principles. So it's probably easier to explain good in many ways is value. So a brand such as Root Perfect, which is a, a value proposition, that's we, we define that as good. Better could be a brand such as Superfacialist, which is neither mass nor premium, it's Mastige, so that's better. And then you have a new brand called The Solution, for example, which launched in Superdrug over the summer. Um, that is £10 for a body lotion, so that's best price. So we undertook that analysis to begin with. Then we looked at each brand and each product and asked ourselves whether it was meeting the specific needs of a consumer and also what the return was from, from that product and therefore whether we needed to continue with it, discontinue it, or add uh, additional features or benefits to make it a more productive SKU. The third area is that we're looking at is over time, and that's very much part of Project 50, is that we've moved to higher margin categories. So we've uh, earmarked those as being skincare, hair care, bath and body. What we are still pleased is that within the breadth of our portfolio is that we have uh, a variety of brands that appeal to uh, both male and female, but different uh, uh, macroeconomic, have taken consideration macroeconomic factors such as the recession. So you'd have a brand such as Root Perfect, which retails in B&M and Home Bargains, um, and that's at you know, £2.99. Or you'd have a Superfacialist, which can retail for £16. So it's a, a very diverse portfolio. And then there's the continuation of retail exclusive brands such as Argon and Sense Bar in Waitrose or Dirty Works in uh, Sainsbury's. But more importantly, we want to invest in, in taking our brands uh, to a wider, uh, to wider portfolio, so an omnichannel approach. What you'll see on the screen now is a sort of traffic light system. So on the left-hand side is you have a list of our brands. So if they are in the green, it means they are being relaunched this year. If they're orange, it means that they are redesigned this year. And if they're green, it means that they were relaunched last year and that we're pleased with how they're performing and their, and their growth potential. So some, a couple of things to point out there. The solution, which is red, uh, is towards the bottom. Um, that's a brand new range. Um, it's essentially skinfication for the body. So it's a, a five ski range that launched into Superdrug. Uh, it's doing extremely well. So that's launched in this fiscal. Um, you'll then see the next column, which is the positioning. So that's whether it's a good, better or best. The status is whether we are positioning it still as an exclusive or whether it's changed. So a 
couple of things to point out there. Happy Naturals, it was an exclusive in Sainsbury's and Kind Nature was an exclusive in Boots. So they, we're changing those. We are presenting and, and have actually presented. So they have very good feedback from our retailers and make those omnichannel. You'll then see on the dots. So a green dot basically indicates that we participate in that category. So on the top line, Argon sold exclusively in Waitrose. So we have, re we have products that are within the hair care, skin care, and the bath and body uh, categories. If there's an orange dot, that basically means that that's potential for us to review uh, in the next two to three years. So from a brand perspective, I think Tom mentioned earlier is that historically brand architects was a more of a sort of, wasn't private label, but there were exclusive brands. And as a consequence, there was no real investment in brand building. It was very much reliant on the consumers finding the products in store. And that can work very well, but for, a, for our ambitions in order to hit Project 50, we want to be investing in brands making them brands so that the consumer is aware of the brand so they go and ask for it when they get to store rather than relying on finding it in store. So there's a couple of things that we need to do that. Um, emphasis is on productivity. So if we are doing fewer, bigger, better SKUs, that improves our inventory management, which means that we've got a better cash flow. We could therefore um, have higher MOQs, minimum order quantities, which should really uh, lead to lower cost of goods. Tom mentioned we need to become a consumer centric business and every touch point uh, we're addressing from that perspective. We will be looking to initiate and implement transformational above the line campaigns. So we are in the process of scoping out super facialist and hopefully we'll be able to announce something in due course. We will be looking to invest in a whole D2C strategy, which I'll come on to in, in, a, in a second and look to appoint a 360 branded agency that can not only help um, help us reach the consumer through traditional media, such as uh, print, uh, but also more importantly, online, working with key opinion uh, leaders, uh, influencers, et cetera. Oops. So I'm just gonna hand you over now to Joe. Joe's gonna take you through top line two brand strategies, just because of uh, Time, we're not going to present the brand strategy for every single one. We'll be here for quite, quite a while. But this is to give you uh, just a, a quick view of how she's approached uh, the turnaround for each brand, but for two. So the first one is going to be Super Facialist. Hi. So, yes, the so Super Facialist, I think the tagline speaks volumes, which is essentially being your own Super Facialist. Now, this tagline has absolutely resonated since lockdown. Um, and we've done phenomenally well off the back of our social media campaigns, but the activation also we've done online. Um, so the vision of this brand quite essentially is we've got a huge ambition. Um, we want this to be a 10 mil net sale brand over the next five years. Um, this brand really resonates not only from um, the demographic of the consumers that we currently sell in from all the retailers, but also from our own dot um, com as well. So essentially, the sort of strategy for this brand is not only to grow awareness across the channels we already sell in, but also to really expand it from a, 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 another set in terms of the dot-com element as well. So the brand values effectively are all around effectiveness. So it is very much an ingredient-led brand, um, but we really lend on the science and nature of that. Um, but it equally look at the innovation pipeline too. So the next slide We'll share with you what our innovation is for this brand for the next three years. So the strategy or innovation pipe is very fundamentally around the gaps that we see not only within the existing portfolio, but also the gap and trends and ideas that we see from a um, customer base as well. So like um, Q and Tom have said, you know, the insights we're getting from our retailers and from EPOS etc has given us this plan for this MPD um, so really driving insights into action so we're looking at a um, an advanced anti-age range um, with the um, hexapeptide 9 um, we're looking also at how people are using skincare so obviously with the um, movement from moving basically consumers moving from um, away from color cosmetics um, into skincare it's how we have that convergence with the products you see in the middle there, the very pretty looking product. Um, and then finally, um, our retinol story is 
were by far our most successful. So we're just adding to that with a, a really smart eye cream, um, which you see on your, um, which is the last silver image you see there as well. Uh, in terms of the forward plan, then we'll just be looking at um, supplements, tools, and other elements that really drive that home at home salon. Um, and that will come over the course of the two, year two and year three. So that's how it looks if you were to go in to store um, probably midway through this year. This is sort of what it looks like. As you can see, very strong brand blocking, um, great colors. Um, and we know from talking to retail trade, they absolutely love it from that respect. So it's very easy to self-select and find what you're looking for. I think I just say that on Superfacious, the couple of uh, wins that we've had since we started the new fiscal. So uh, Superfacious has launched into Waitrose, uh, delivering fantastic results. It's just gone into Morrison's. Uh, we launched into Douglas in Romania. So this is uh, definitely our growth brand, principally because it's capturing the zeitgeist at the moment. You can't have, you can't go out for facials, so people are doing their facials at home. So the other brand I want to talk to you about is um, a, a really great brand. And again, really capturing sort of the mood of what we're seeing, not only from a consumer point, but just from a trend point in terms of social media. So the vision of this brand effectively is to be um, is to be recognized as not just a beauty brand, but a lifestyle brand. So it's encompassing everything that's kind and is giving back to society. Um, it, ultimately, we're just about basically bringing a brand to market that doesn't just look after yourself, but will look after the planet as well. So the consumer for this brand is very much that sort of aspiring eco warrior. She's that 28 to 45 year old, likely to be um, a mum or recently married, but she's very, very socially conscious and wants to do her bit to society, but also to the environment as a whole. Um, the next slide demonstrates the, um, again, the brand lineup. So this is how it looks at the minute. So if you were to go into a high street retailer, this is what you would effectively see. But we're really radically changing the look and feel of the brand to really step on that whole eco message. So the next slide will show the new um, massive step change in terms of that look and feel. So a massive nod to the um, the, the sort of themes and and, and storytell from a, an eco point but also really giving it great standout on fixture, but more importantly, we'll give standout on digital. So no longer are we looking at it from just a, a nice looking product on shelf. We have to make sure it resonates and it shows um, what it does from a digital point as well on screen. So that's the lineup from a foot hair. And then the final lineup here is on foot care. So it's, it's a broad range. The roadmap again, um, just shows sort of the lineup of the next three years. We will relaunch this um, midway through next year, and then we'll continue to grow and expand on that brand um, throughout year two and year three. So most of the um, of those nine brands that we're looking to either relaunch or upgrade, they will be landing in store from March through to June uh, 2021. Just quickly like to talk about routes to market. So you'd have heard all of us mentioning Omnichannel. Uh, so what we really mean by omnichannel distribution is wherever the consumer wants to buy a product, we are there. So that could be in the likes of Boots and Superdrug. Uh, it could be in the grocers. It could be in pure retailers such as Amazon or Look Fantastic, Feel Unique, uh, as well as D2C, which actually is point three. We do have a, an international business, which is very important to us and an area that we think we can grow and um, see significant return. So we'll be looking to focus on probably the bigger, um, fewer bigger markets. Um, it lends, our brands lend itself to English speaking countries. We are quite English uh, heavy on pack in terms of copy. Um, so it wouldn't surprise you that we'd look to focus uh, markets such as Australia, New Zealand, Canada, but also um, some European markets like the Nordics and Germany. So Germany, although it doesn't speak English, have a lot of similarities in terms of consumer behavior. The D2C strategy is probably the most important strategy that we're, that we're reviewing and implementing over the next six months. So we have, since in this fiscal, we have appointed a couple of uh, key uh, new positions. So we've got the head of digital. Um, so they started a month ago. Uh, and uh, SAFE, his name is, is basically working with us uh, to look to create our own marketplace. 
So um, it's too early to announce anything, but we've got exciting plans to have a marketplace where it's an opportunity to purchase all our brands within a sort of community feel. And that will be towards uh, the end of the fiscal, i.e. May, June time. But what we'll be doing in the meantime with our uh, e-commerce sites is investing in PPC uh, and greater use of analytics, social media remarketing. We'll be looking to have in place weekly newsletters, uh, investment in affiliates, uh, and then as part of the uh, upgrade to the new marketplace, there'll be the ability to have on-site reviews. That's also is not to ignore the fact that you know we need to um, grow our distribution in pure plays. So we have a we've had good growth in Amazon uh, since COVID. Actually, we've had good growth in Feel Unique. We're in conversations with getting listings with Look Fantastic in January, um, and we're having conversations with the likes of Beauty Bay Boohoo. So it's important that that pillar is, is not ignored either. I was going to talk about M and A. Yes, so another key part of uh, delivering a 50 million net sales business five years' time is, of course, uh, using the cash on the balance sheet uh, for selected M&A investments. Um, so clearly what we're looking to do is further strengthen in the areas that we are strong at, so stick to the knitting very much in terms of our category expertise, so skincare, hair care, bath and body. Uh, but also strengthen uh, our proposition, uh, not only in the channels that uh, Quentin uh, talked about in the previous slide, but also uh, with regards to the consumer. And clearly with a view to a marketplace as well, uh, whilst we're sort of blessed with a uh, very strong, diverse portfolio, identify any gaps uh, in that portfolio as we really try to sort of push uh, D2C um, and also internationally. Um, from a consumer uh, point of view, obviously any acquisition, the, uh, the, the product or the brand will obviously need to be um, appropriate both from a current point of view, but also with future consumer trends. Uh, so very much looking at those consumer behaviours, not only in terms of the products they want, uh, but where they buy it. And ideally, uh, those brands or products will have some kind of point of difference in the market or proprietary technology. Um, ideally, we're looking for uh, a brand acquisition that would add scale. Uh, that's uh, probably the best thing to really add to our top line. Uh, but we will look uh, across the piece for good deals and obviously where we identify opportunities that could be ready, readily scalable, uh, leveraging our existing skill sets, uh, we'll of course uh, consider those as well. So in conclusion, um, we are now a solely focused profitable branded business. We have a new and experienced leadership team in place. We believe there's some very exciting opportunities to grow the business both domestically and internationally, and in particular online. We have a substantial net cash position. We have a distinctive and appealing brand portfolio, and hopefully even more appealing in six to seven months. We have uh, ongoing <laughs> established relationships with retailers both domestically and internationally, and there's potential for M&A. So that takes us to the end of the presentation. Um, apologies if you've been asking questions as we've gone through, but we thought we'd present the sort of the strategy and the vision for where we're going, and then we should be able to answer any questions as it comes through. That's so I'm just going to. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, do, do please continue to submit questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, I'd also like to remind you that a recording of the presentation is available on a copy of the slides on the Investor Meet Company platform. Um, but lastly, before we do hand back to the Brand Architects team, I'd like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. And immediately after the presentation has ended, you will be redirected the opportunity to provide that feedback. Um, Guys, I know I haven't perhaps given you a huge amount of time to actually look at the questions, yeah. but um, if you can pop them up in front of you um, and, and perhaps just start at the top and, and just read out those that you're, you're uh, happy to answer and who they're from, that'd be fantastic. Sure. So the first question is from Roger H, which is what has happened to the real shaving company uh, revalued and provided for in the accounts? One question and then, are there any plans to return cash to shareholders? So. Tom, do you want to answer that? Sure. So um, there's sort of two, two key questions there. So in terms of the real shave company, obviously, from an accounting perspective, um, 
you have to look at the intangible values uh, at the year end. You look at that with reference to the discounted cash flows and effectively compare the discounted cash flows versus the intangible value uh, on the balance sheet at that point in time. So we do that across all our intangibles. And for the real shave company, I think um, obviously sort of Quentin can elaborate a bit more, uh, but clearly um, the activity in the real shave company and the trajectory of the sales meant that the discounted cash flows could no longer substantiate the intangible value on the balance sheet. That's not to say we've given up on the real shave company. I think, I mean, do you want to talk about sort of the plans yeah. within that? So yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not um, sort of throwing the real shave company out. We just think that it's it lost a bit of uh, direction over the last couple of years. So what we're doing is consolidating it. So they'll, we'll be focusing on uh, one shave range. So there's a, a gel, um, there is a foam. Um, so basically going back to, to basics really with it. And we have a brand called True Shave, which we are rolling into the real shave. So that's a value proposition. So I just think over the last few years, it's it's slightly lost its way and it ended up having a age denying range, which was considerably more expensive than the market. Um, and it wouldn't merit that positioning. So what we're doing is consolidating the real shave into fewer SKUs, getting a very competitive uh, retail price so that it can compete uh, with the likes of Gillette, Nivea, uh, bulldog etc and there's the second part of the question so are there any plans to return cash to shareholders so one of the key things of course that the board needs to look at is driving shareholder value but from our perspective i think as we've outlined quite clearly in this plan uh, we're very bullish about the opportunities to deliver product 50. not only will that driver deliver a business of scale uh, but it should uh, deliver a business that can um, so generate improved margins both gross margins and ebitda margins and therefore ultimately value to shareholders. So certainly from that perspective, um, using the cash on the balance sheet to invest in M&A is going to be key to achieve that. Um, but we also would want to use the cash to invest in many organic opportunities, which we think could deliver great value, uh, not least to mention the D to C play. The other thing worth mentioning, of course, that on our balance sheet is we do have a defined benefit pension scheme. So any considerations for uh, returning cash, we also need to consider them as a key stakeholder going forward. But all in all, uh, we think we can drive great value for shareholders. That was the key part of uh, divesting the, um, the contract manufacturing business. We're very optimistic about that future. Thank you, Tom. Abby R has written uh, a couple of questions. So what acquisition opportunities are you seeing and what is the mix between organic versus M&A that you're looking to achieve? So um, not surprisingly, we are constantly evaluating uh, opportunities that uh, come our way through the corporate finance houses. But also Tom and myself are, are proactive in talking to uh, entrepreneurs, uh, as well as the slightly bigger organizations to find out uh, what's, what's available. The key thing is that you, you know, we need to make the right acquisition. We, you know, we don't want to make a mistake. We need to ad uh, adhere to the uh, strategic objectives that Tom outlined earlier. So does it have synergies with our business? Are we able to grow it? Will it give us a degree of scale? Um, does it, is it ideally helping us either in a D2C or an international footprint? So at the moment, we haven't been able to find something that um, ticks all those boxes. Um, but, you know, who knows? So we, we are always reviewing opportunities. And the second part of that question is, um, as part of our Project 50 uh, net sales target, approximately we would say that 15 million comes from M&A and 35 comes through organic growth domestically and internationally. So, okay, Abby R, I'm assuming it's the same Abby, has another question. Uh, great update. What do you see as the greatest risk of the business moving forward? Probably all three of us answer that. Um, COVID is having an impact. I think we've, uh, but it's it's mixed, um, and that no one can sort of hide from the fact that COVID is decimating the high street. So we are seeing a downturn in the likes of footfall in Boots and Superdrug, but we are fortunate that we're seeing strong uh, growth within the grocers and uh, significant growth online. And online, to be fair, is where our efforts are, are going to be focused going forward. Um, other risks potentially would be 
whether in you know, all the relaunch activity, although we've had excellent response from retailers, there's always an element of risk that it that it may not uh, deliver the return that we expect it to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think also, I mean, clearly there's changes in buying habits. We'll see how much those kind of embed. Yeah. So clearly the e-tail uh, play, the D2C play, uh, which brings both risk and opportunity to us. But I think also in the traditional channels, if I could put it that way, in terms of the, the bricks and mortar retailers, they obviously are beefing up their online play. And we take quite a small share at the moment of a very big market. So we think there's great opportunities in that area of the market, even though there are risks mm -hmm. attached. But also, I think it's how we make our and continue to make our products relevant to consumers. I think that's ultimately the biggest risk. They're the ultimate customer. Um, and I think a lot of what we're doing in terms of investing in uh, in the data, um, having a, a short and agile MPD process, and really investing in our multi-channels to market, hopefully we can turn that risk into an opportunity and deliver our plan. Yeah, I think that basically what we're saying is that if we don't listen to the consumer, and that's our biggest risk. So we know yeah. things like uh, the sustainability requirements. So there's a the plastic tax or the plastic backlash. So you know we need to be cognizant uh, that we're addressing those needs in terms of our you know our component tree. Um, we also, if she's if she's selling online, that we need to be selling online. I mean, reselling her buying. Uh, so the most important thing is understanding the consumer. And as a business, if we don't, that will be the biggest risk. Um, Peter D has written a question, will the spend for extra marketing be significant? So I mean, I can start off by saying that obviously as Quentin outlined in the presentation, you know, we've come from being a product led business. Mm. Uh, what we're looking to do is not a walk away from that heritage, but build on that really a kind of brand building business. So currently the advertising promotion spend or previously in historic years has been low uh, for the reasons that Quentin outlined. What we will be doing is uh, significantly increasing that investment, but clearly we'll do that in a very efficient way. Uh, we will try to do that as much as we can digitally. Uh, we will also uh, track that in stage gates, but ultimately uh, we will always measure the return on investment uh, and so that the extra marketing spend um, should deliver uh, clearly extra revenue and extra profit to the bottom line, albeit there may be phasing differences as you go along. Yeah, we're going through, we certainly wouldn't be looking to support all brands with that with a significant or transformational advertising campaign. So we are reviewing Super Facialist. That's the uh, the one brand we're seeing significant growth, both from a, a sell through perspective, but also from a distribution. So when we do invest, it will be significant from our perspective. And uh, as Tom said, it's predominantly going to be digital. So you can always turn things on or off. So Imran K, to what extent, sorry, to what extent do your products depend on animal testing? Can you develop a brand that is not using animal testing? Do you want to answer? Yeah, I mean, we we don't test on animals. Um, that's absolutely, you know, within the back pack of every product we sell. And that's actually standard now. Um, so it's a given. I think what we're moving towards is obviously the vegan friendly. That's taken a massive um trend over the last two years so we're making that more front and center on our pack so you can see there's an image there of kind of nature i think you'll probably still be able to see that uh, it's got vegan friendly right slap bang in the middle um so no i mean it's just then what's next so you know that's sort of something that my head of mpd is looking at obviously the sustainability piece is substantial um how we're responding to that is still um you know something we're developing but you know we're already given what I've just shared with you on kind nature, we're already taking that into heavy account. Um, so moving to PCR packaging for that brand. Um, yeah, I'd basically say it's transparency. So as yeah. a business, we need to be transparent in terms of where we're sourcing, where our raw materials come from, you know, can, is our, um, our sort of ethos is recycle, reuse. Um, so yes, but there's no animal testing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Indeed. I, think you've, questions, unless I, think you, I think you've actually gone through all of those questions. Um, if there are any other questions that do come in, obviously the company can review those um, and publish responses where appropriate to do so. Um, just on that basis, uh, Quinton, perhaps I should ask you a few words just to, to wrap up before we redirect investors for feedback. Sure. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hopefully we've been able to give you a 
a flavor of the strategic direction that we're taking the company. So we are all very excited um, about Project 50. We realize it's an ambitious target, but we think with the, the pillars that Tom outlined earlier, so the foundation of operational efficiency, but then really about building our brands, um, D2C is the, probably one of the most important transformational advertising campaigns. So uh, we think we've got a strategy in place uh, that will enable us to deliver Project 50. The key is now going to be the proofs in the pudding, really. So um, it does take a while to turn these brands around. So when you look to relaunch, it's not something you can do immediately. Often you have to have compatibility and stability testing, but also you need to work with uh, retailers' range cycles. Um, but we think we're going to be in a very good position from uh, you know, July onwards. So thank you. If there are any other questions, we can we can come back and answer. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Quinton. Thank you, Thomas and Joe, for updating investors today. Um, could I ask investors not to close the session as you are now automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you've accessed the meeting from my website, the feedback page will appear in front of you. If you've accessed it via the email, uh, you'll be asked just to log back in, uh, click on the link, log back in and give your feedback. Please do take a few minutes because it's highly valued by the company. On behalf of Brand Architects PRC and Investor Meet Company, we'd like to thank you for attending to today. That concludes today's presentation and good evening to everybody. Thank you again for attending. Thank you.